catch up to Berkeley there because they have the best division of systems and control. But I guess the only consolation we can get from this is that Professor Thomas Zucker is, in fact, an MIT graduate. Uh, so uh, he'll be talking to us about mechatronics and Y2K status report. Professor Thomas Zucker. Thank you very much. That was a bad introduction. Oh. <laughs> it makes us look more humble than we actually are. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yes, thank you very much for including somebody not from MIT. <laughs> so I, I would take this opportunity to really go through what we are doing in the area of mechatronics and parking. And I'll start with some general comment on mechatronics. Also, yesterday there was some good talk about me, uh, mentioning about mechatronics. I don't have to, but I have been giving this kind of talk at several places. I just changed the title. I think it's the thousand so I put Y2K status before. And if we say mechatronics, there are also mechatronics devices in the market. But here is some fine data that I'm not really defining mechatronics in narrow sense, just refer to this the, the product. And in fact, the definition has been evolving started in 1969, Japanese started using it. And at the beginning, people really referred to some electromechanical systems. And I was doing the chief editor of the IEEE SME transaction on mechatronics up until December 1999. And there, we used a lot of definition similar to that different, the synergetic integration of mechanical engineering with electronic and intelligent computer control in the design or manufacture of industrial product and processes. Now, if we, this was in 1996, but now everybody talking about information technology, if we would have started journal, maybe instead of electronics, we would have say something information technology, and instead of computer control, would, I would have put more abstract word like complex decision making. So therefore, the Y2K definition may lead something like the synergetic integration of physical systems with information technology and complex decision making. The other part, if you like, you can still keep, but it's not that important. The, when we say information technology, I think Nam Su has some good definition of what is information, what is information technology, but it's essentially the same thing. I'm putting some devices which would store information and so forth, but starting from electronics, microprocessor in 1970s to some network communication, internet embedded DSP. Those are home from what I mean here by information technology here. On the decision making side, I'm referring to so my favorite area, control theory, design methodology, while in more recent development in the area of hybrid system theory and so forth. So in the mainstream, of course, there is a physical systems. And physical systems I see gaining more, more and more important importance in our life is something like bioengineering and medicine, energy transportation, or intelligent transportation systems environmental engineering and manufacturing. I picked up this list from a recent publication from ASME. It said mechanical engineering in the 21st century, and it came out September 1999, last year. It's one of a few publications from ASME which I quite agree very much and see quite useful. And by the way, they, they are listing 10, and of course at the top, the so something which would make the difference in the next century, say, put information technology. And the way I see is that the first three more or less talking about some en what I might call enabling technology. And here is the last five defining some exciting area. And mechatronics somehow come here to synthesize and utilize enabling technology in each specific domain area to make the thing things more exciting. Now, the, of course, the driving forces of mechatronics was I put information technology, it's making inf mechatronics more and more exciting, but certainly, of course, need from 
industry. And those two combined are really introducing new ways of doing things, new pattern of thinking. Or people, some people prefer to call mechatronics simply as the best practice. So certainly that best practice is evolving as the technology develops. Need from industry. This is from a talk by Mike Marston, Texas Instrument. He put together a general trend in industry. And lots of things already said yesterday. And some of the things which may not have been explicitly said. But I think you know most of the things here. And one thing probably <laughs> which interesting is this teams, teamworks are preferred approach. So I would comment later, but the, some of the, the courses that we teach in this area, we try to teach some teamwork through the project work. Now, let me go through some recent research at UCB we, in the area of controls or mechatronics. And good part of the, the, the topics that myself and my control colleagues, but I added something which is really relevant to information technology, which is not quite my area, like cyber cut by Professor Light and some of the Professor Agagino's work. I think she is a member of the advisory committee and she'll be coming tomorrow. Now, the area of computer disk drives, this research is conducted in the computer mechanics laboratory, and it's a consortium of industrial consortium and in the controls area, myself and Professor Horowitz have been looking into this area and to really to answer to the need from the, the hard disk industries. They are striving for higher density storage, faster seek time, and of course, lowering cost. The, if we look at some schematic, what's going on, there are two types of problem. And one is so-called track following. The, the recording head has to stay on that, the data track. And I think it's supposed to be circle, but it's not quite. There is some random error, or in case of removable storage devices, there might be some eccentricity. And there are also work going on, but some recent work is one of my students finishing in the area so-called repetitive control. This is a methodology which really deals with periodic disturbances. And uh, the repetitive control is ideally suited for this type of problem because disk is spinning at some fixed speed. So the same pattern appears many times. So it's essentially how you may drop sensitivity to almost to zero at certain frequencies. The disk drive industry use so-called sector drive. Sector drive is that the circular disk is sliced into the area, and so-called position information is written only at the boundary. So you would like to keep the number of sectors small so you have more area for storing data. But sometimes that you cannot get enough some the, the frequencies, measurement frequency, for doing some fine control. Now, instead of adding the sectors and putting more information, there has been some work to increase some effective bandwidth by updating the input more frequent than the measurement frequencies. And that's called multi-rate control. And it's a very interesting area, both from control point of view and for this type of application point of view. And another student is finishing her PhD, in this case, she in this area. And also, the traditional disk files that you find in your computer has got only one actuator, voice coil motor. But everybody is now working on how you can introduce second stage actuator. Essentially, you put more freedom so for fine motion control. And the next, the, the immediately what coming out probably in the market is the one utilizing piezoelectric, uh, piezo transducer. And certainly, we are working in this area. Also, my colleague, Horowitz, in collaboration with Pisano Howe, they are really MEMS faculty member, is looking into the next generation, the second stage actuator, by utilizing MEMS technology. And this work is sponsored by DARPA. And they are working with IBM. 
So this is their rotary type actuator. They designed both rotary type actuator and the linear actuator, two point millimeter diameter, and they have already closed loop, and they have got the basic performance. One area I'm working with Horowitz is an NSF GORI project with Xerox Corporation for making the paper handling part of the copying machine more reliable and more intelligent. And it's really a mechatronics product, and we are suggesting to introduce some mechatronics thinking in the product design. So we are looking into some new ways of handling the papers in the copying machine. Traditional machine, essentially you can think about that there has got one big conveyor belt. Paper is fed from one end and brought to the image transfer station, and there is some control going on, but from here to there, there is essentially no control, open loop control. So as a result, the problem you experience is so-called soft jam or hard jams. When the, 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 some measurement station, they are checking whether the paper is present or not. If the paper does not come at the expected moment, the computer or the, the controller thinks that something went wrong and simply stops the machine. And even though the paper may not be jamming, but software found jam, so it's called software jam. And we are trying to make it better at least remove software jam by breaking up the conveyor, big conveyor into several sections and add sensor and actuator at each stage. Certainly this will complicate the problem. And you, if you have many sensor and actuators, if you do not have good way of deciding the control action, this is not a kind of scheme that you'd like to employ. But with some power of the computer now, this is quite feasible. And so we are looking into this problem. Still, we have to do some economic consideration. So what will be the required number of actuators and sensors? We cannot just add too many from cost point of view also, and also reliability and maintenance. And also the problem itself is quite interesting because paper is moving. And there are lots of constraints generated when paper is handed from one station to another. You do not want to back or you do not want to stretch because you might end up adding some marks. And also, if you purpose is to essentially control the distance from one paper to another. So if it's too close, we would like to increase the separation. But there is only a limited time window that you can apply the control, feedback control. So it turns out to be a nice example of the hybrid system, discrete event systems, and intellectually quite, it's, it's a very quite challenging. Most of the thing we do, we would like to do experimental check. Otherwise, uh, the, the people won't believe us, but also the, by working on the real hardware, we find lots of interesting problems. So in this case, we got part from Xerox and we made some top desktop the paper pass. Okay. And it has got essentially three parts. Each part can be independently controlled. And of course we have some paper feeder and paper can either going around for many times or we have some exit gate that controlled so paper can come out. This is a motor, and measurement at this stage is a motor measurement. And also, the roller is really physically moving the paper, but we are measuring the position of the roller. It's best to measure where paper is, if, and also if we can measure the paper velocity. So we are also adding photo sensor to detect the position and velocity of the paper. California has got a PASS program. It's a very big program. PASS stands for Partners for Advanced Transit and Highways. It started in 1986. And there are lots of interesting control problems in the PASS area. 
in particular, advanced vehicle control and safety systems. It's a lot of interesting control problem for mechanical engineering students, mechanical engineers. So, uh, Professor Hedrick, a former faculty at MIT, and myself have been working a lot in this area, and especially from automated driving, AHS point of view. In 1997, we had a high point of the past work. This was a slide from the 1997 National Automated Highway Systems Consortium demo done in San Diego. And essentially, past work, the research work at PASS resulted into the demo by 8K Platoon. So, so 8K is making some sort of train operation. They have very tight longitudinal control. And Professor Hedrick's initial work really resulted in doing this tight longitudinal control. My group has been working on automated steering for many years, and that really helped the doing this demo. Essentially, what we do is we put magnet in the middle of the road. Magnet is about four feet apart, and magnetometer sends the distance, and then steering action is figured out by computer. So it's completely hand-free driving. He's putting hand. And now, after this demo, of course, the National Consortium was disbanded, discontinued. But now the California is continuing this automated highway effort with emphasis on these heavy vehicles. So I'm currently working with my graduate student on the automated steering for this truck. This is Fred Reiner truck. In fact, this is our current test truck. Some magnet technology has been shifted applied to some of the maintenance, road maintenance work by Caltrans people, California Department of Transportation. We have some snow countries, and uh, they have got the idea to put magnet and do some guide vehicle while for the maintenance operation, for safe maintenance operation. They are not immediately interested in automating the operation, but try to come up with some way of assisting the human driver. When you are re removing the snow, when the wind blows, there is so-called white out condition generated. Driver instantaneously lose sight. So in that case, how the magnet information combined with some dynamic predi prediction of where the vehicle may be going, may be displayed on the screen. So the driver can easily detect, or he, he can even can drive looking at the screen. Uh, it's an interesting man machine interface design problem because you would like to see that the driver be not confused by looking at screen. He should be able to switch back and forth and still maintain some smooth operation. And one student is finishing PhD currently on this subject. So this is a typical application. This is not snow plow, this is snow blower. And in case of snow blower, Caltrans are interested in control even the automated driving, so we are starting that project. The Kazaruni, Professor Kazaruni, he's a graduate of MIT okay, also. The, he, he has been working on the combination of the human intelligence and the power available from the, the hardware devices. And he has been calling extenders. He joined us from Minnesota six probably five, six years ago. And this is a device he designed at a Minnesota, but it's a very early version of the, his, uh, it's, uh, really making his idea of human intelligence plus mechanical power into some the hardware device. And the more recently, he has been working on from arm to leg and some of, this is some of his recent work, Power Lower Extremity Enhancer. And you can see some device. And this is a recent experiment he conducted at Berkeley. And the idea is by having this device, people can carry a lot of heavy things and some battleground and so forth. By the way, this is one slide he requested me not to put on the web. Okay, so, so, so I, I, I will just eliminate this slide okay, when, when you, 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 I give you a copy. Okay. 
Okay, this is the professor I said to probably Sanjay can explain this slide much better than I do. But this is the uh, right has uh, so some interesting idea. Now everybody is talking about how you can make use of the resource available at remote locations to accomplish your job. Okay, so essentially network manufacturing service and this area is really his activity is expanding. I think Ford Motor Company has donated some quite a bit of money to, to even try this kind of thing on the education side, education aspect. Okay. Now this is a slide that I received from Alice Agagino. So I cannot add too much except it is written down here. This is her research project. The concept database, an overview. It's essentially a multimedia network conceptual design support tool. Okay. And some smart navigation through a hypermedia database of link design concept and electronic component catalogs, etc. And her present research of this research address aspect listed here. Some of the things which I personally find interesting is to manage uncertainties in design, decision making, intelligent real time design. Okay. So how real time, the, the, this network the based the tool can assist the designer. She has made some prototype conceptual database. And in fact, one of her goal here, mechatronics is a very important aspect in her research. I didn't quite mention, but at the bottom, she put that domain of application is mechatronics design. So it's highly relevant to mechatronics. Okay. And this is for assisting the motor selection. So she put lots of intelligence there. Now, let me just comment some educational challenge from mechatronics point of view and what we are doing at UC Berkeley. As, uh, as, uh, as I see it, all, all ME and E students should be exposed to mechatronics thinking. So for the student needs to experience from mechanical design, information technology, and so forth, to team through teamwork. And but also, this area, technology keeps changing. So students should be trained to be forward looking and curious. What we provide at the, 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 the school will ne never be the all. And maybe in a few years, it's just old stuff. So unless they have the, the trained to be study themselves or curious, look into new areas, we are not doing the right job. The last comment is more addressed when I give this kind of talk outside the United States. I suppose we are, everybody is using English. Now, laboratory work is essential in this area. So we have both undergraduate, graduate courses to the students do some laboratory work. Often we make a team and through that, people will learn some complexity aspect, the system aspect we are doing. So several things happen at the same time. Error depends on minor changes in timing. The best way to learn this type of aspect is through actually project work. This is an undergraduate course that he, Kazaruni, is teaching. And so if you look at the syllabus, it's from some microcontroller, electronic motors, and so forth. So this is covered by the lecture. But on the top of that, he has a project. Everybody has to accomplish project. By the way, when student takes this course, student has not taken necessarily feedback control courses. And we can never underestimate the creativity of undergraduate student without control courses, formal control courses. Student, in fact, does lots of interesting project. This is one project from last year, automatic bicycle gear shifter. It's quite innovative. And some walking robot. And it walks 
and to change the direction, it has got some another motor spinning. So depending on in which way motor is spinning, it starts making a very interesting maneuvering. This is from a course developed by another MIT graduate, in fact, the, the David Auslander. Okay. He has been the kind of the leader in the area of introducing microcomputers to a control curriculum. And this is a switching control, he calls switching control. But essentially, it's a discrete event system. Many things happen, and how that the, the computer system can detect which the operation he is in. In this particular case, train is going around. At one point, train motion has to be synchronized with the motion of this conveyor thing, which is carrying some iron ball. It's magnet, so by on off switch, magnet can either on this side or magnet can be dropped, or a ball can be dropped. So it's a loading the move, the, some steel ball on the train while the train is in motion. So just by doing this, the student can lots of interesting aspects for real-time programming. Now, the graduate level of the education, I have to really say that fundamentals really emphasize the fundamentals. Fundamentals are really fundamental. And I think we do quite a good job in this area also. Now, topics for dissertation research. OK, this is something quite opposite what uh, Professor Su was mentioning yesterday. Two minutes. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so balance between theory and application, as I see, is very important. Of course, it doesn't have to be 50-50 split. In my case, I'm quite adjusted to the type of the student, so it's customized. Some students are analytically excelling. The theory part could be 90%, and application part could be 10 Or the other way around, somebody more technology-oriented, I could put, let him emphasize more this aspect. But I think at, the, at some point in the, the, the life, especially student life, students should be exposed to both. And of course, that's related to the research funding. But uh, we have been so far lucky to find some exciting projects for students. And especially for PhD, we are, I think that least UC Berkeley, our goal is to really train future leaders, both in academia and in industry. And we, so far, we have been quite successful. When we say fundamental, essentially every aspect, but if you look at the kind of list of courses that we are giving at the graduate level, we are very happy that we have from both technology end to the theory end. And especially the control theory side, we have a very good coverage. And we make it sure that we give this kind of control theory courses every semester. It's not really a control courses given for the curiosity of the only faculty members, we are giving these courses for students. So even when somebody goes to sabbatical, we make it sure that the course is covered. This is another aspect of probably of in the education. This is the outcome of the Alice Agagino's effort of the, the National Coalition, Synthesis Coalition. It's now continuing as a needs, National Engineering Education Delivery System Digital Library. And you can check this on the internet. So if you say mechatronics, you can go through some of the modules that she has developed, or her group has developed, not necessarily all from Berkeley. OK. Oops. OK, so let me conclude my talk by stating that Information technology add a new dimension to mechatronics. Mechatronics is essential in all the engineering in the information age. And lifelong, lifelong learning aspect is important. And so is system level thinking and teamwork. Thank you very much. stop in a 25 minutes to talk, but uh, you didn't mention where you guys are going. Hmm. OK. I think that uh, we are essentially just, uh, going in the direction information technology area. 
we talked about whether we should make something more option at this undergraduate level. There is some divided opinion. Okay. The, we are not quite convinced to, to make a two pass. One, but because there's a, always the a department did not come agreement. Okay. The, some, somebody always wants to keep the, the way that we have been doing. And the, then the, the, some new people would like to do some more emphasis on information technology. So for required courses, we once thought about whether we might be able to make two, two versions. One with some computational information technology thing, and the other one with, without just traditional way. But I think two version idea is not a good idea. So eventually what I'm thinking, what I'm seeing is we will be introducing more and more information technology, at least use a computational thing in the, the education of the undergraduate education. So that's definitely happening. Now, and also the, the I, men I mentioned yesterday a little bit, but we are at the situation that may be close to the Silicon Valley. Student attention is very much directed to the computer science. And we have to really make a good case how mechanical engineering will grow in that environment. So one idea which was really discussed among the college was that probably the, the information technology computational things does not have to be taught only all in computer science. But if we do, whether we can set up an attractive courses that we can draw lots of students. But at least when we are hiring new people, we are looking into what kind of the expertise new guy have so they can naturally participate in the area of the computational engineering information technology aspect. So that's one, one thing we have been into looking into. And maybe from research point of view, the, it all depends on the individual faculty member. It's more the Berkeley environment. The, pre, probably MIT, the situation must be the same. It's pretty much bottom up. Each individual's faculty member's interest is, uh, the, and everybody's sensitive. So the, they are introducing some new idea into the research. But we do not have any really strategic thing, except that we say that, OK, we emphasize bioengineering. Mechanical engineering saying that we will emphasize bioengineering manufacturing for a long period. But bioengineering is certainly not just mechanical engineering subject. So the college started mechanic department of mechanic, uh, bioengineering a few years ago. So it's a f the single independent department. So that, that's a kind of new things happening. Okay, let's thank our speaker again. Okay. Our next speaker is Professor Dan Perlman. Uh, he is a professor at Department 10 at Purdue University. And he'll be telling us about uh, the uh, mechanical engineering and information technology at Purdue. Oh, and while he's switching over, uh, let me just make a comment, which is uh, 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 Professor Tomasinko's talk reminded me that you know, after all, information has been in mechanical engineering for a long time. Right? I'm, when I, I'm teaching the uh, big undergraduate control theory course right now, and every control theory book points out to you that the whole reason that the Watt is called the Watt is not because Watt invented the steam engine, but because he invented the governor for the steam engine. The governor is a simple feedback device. Its goal is simply to process information. And it was the governor that made the machine engine a useful tool upping its efficiency and power capacity by, by many factors of 10. Oh, sorry, by factors of 10 to 100. Okay, so I mean, information technology has always been in mechanical engineering. And mechatronics, I think, particularly these beautiful examples that we just heard, shows you how that has blossomed as the capacities for information processing have grown. Okay, there's a real question. Thank you, Seth. Well, as, as you said, my name is Dan Hurlman. I'm from Purdue University. and. Uh, Oh, I accepted the uh, invitation to speak here and then saw the program and saw that I was last on the program. So I began to check into that and, and I know the reason now. I have no connection with MIT. <laughs> 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 I've never been here. Now. Actually, that's not totally true. I, I did, uh, I did uh, 
interview here, I guess you'd say, when I was looking to where to go to school for a PhD with John Haywood when I was in the combustion business, but ended up choosing to go to Purdue, so maybe that's another reason it's not. Uh, the School of NE at Purdue has uh, uh, a long history, and just to put it in context with the MIT uh, group, we graduate a little under 300 students a year, so we sort of graduate the size of MIT's undergraduate program each year, so we're three or four times that in size. We have about 50 faculty, uh, something like 300 uh, grad students. And we've definitely begun to focus on, on IT and how that will play into our school. I think that's still a process. Uh, one of the exciting things, we opportunities we have is a, a professorship the Federson professorship focused ex exactly on that interface between ME and IT, so that's something we're in the process of filling. Uh-oh. Now, information technology, don't want to exactly define it, but we sort of view it as, as where computing and communications come together and ask the question, how does that influence mechanical engineering, both practice and education? Now, if you look at the, the spectrum, another way of sort of thinking of information, this is kind of a progression. You start with data and assemble it in ways to make information. In principle, you package information and we pass on or, or help our students acquire knowledge. I guess at the top of this food chain is wisdom. So information is down here in information technology. Another way to think of it is how do we package it and convert it into knowledge of our students. Uh, just a thought as we think about education. This is something attributed to Benjamin Franklin, but out of a, a reference listed there. Students are not receptacles. Information transfer alone is not education. Education is what remains after the information and training have been forgotten. So we do need to convey information, but we, but we certainly don't want to stop there. Now, in terms of my talk, um, I think of sort of these four facets of ME and IT. And certainly there are many ways in which our uh, profession contributes to the information technology revolution. We've heard some good examples of that just previously. Um, the other side of that equation is that information technology certain Im certainly will impact mechanical engineering practice. And then there's a couple other educational com contributions as well. Now, as a department head, when I uh, knew that I was going to give this talk, the first thing I'd do, it sounds like the same thing uh, Professor Tomazuka did, is you send out an email or chat with them folks and say, I'm going to talk about IT and ME. Do you have anything you'd like me to show? And then I get about 500 slides. So I'm going to move into the, I haven't checked this with our, our chairperson, but um, I'm going to take a chance that you'll stipulate that I could show you a lot of slides of ME faculty that do really neat things related to ME and IT. And I'm going to skip those. And if you don't believe me that I could do that, then look on the web afterwards and, and, and uh, check it out. But certainly there's a lot of contributions I believe our faculty have made, are making and have made uh, computation in many ways, virtual sensors, uh, heat transfer for the industry, data storage technology, wafer inspection, handling, and the like. There's certainly a large contribution that our, our school and our faculty have made, as have uh, the MIT and Berkeley faculty as well. Now, in terms of how we are implementing information technology in our education, this is some, a slide that I showed yesterday. I'm going to briefly talk about these and then really kind of switch gears uh, toward the end of my presentation. But we're trying to do uh, web enhanced, web based courses. We've done distance design teams. Again, the communications aspect of technology enables that. We have an interesting project teaming business and engineering students around some information technology. We certainly are including advanced simulation tools in our undergraduate courses. That allows you to do some more interesting things. 
And then we're certainly in the domain of, of doing virtual uh, lab experiments. Now, in terms of web enhanced courses, uh, we have a number of experiments going, as do you, and, and most of you, I'm sure. So we use streaming video and PowerPoint notes and uh, chat rooms and, and frequently asked questions. And we think that is a way to certainly uh, leverage the faculty time and expertise and make a better educational experience for some of our uh, students. We mentioned the other day about how we use uh, communications technology and some other types of information technology for distance design teams across schools, across countries, across companies. Uh, this was a project I mentioned the other day, yesterday in the panel, uh, a joint where we try to team business MBA students with PhD students and, and accelerate that commercialization step into the last couple years of a PhD project. And we're doing some virtual uh, lab experiments as well as our uh, a number of you. I'll skip over these. Now, actually, for the rest of the talk, I'm going to take a little different approach. I think I won't come up with con conclusions that are startling based on our, our conversation. But I guess you'd say it's a, a different way of looking at the rationale. If you think about the impact on education and then delivery, this, I think delivery enables mass customization. The information technology and its the potential in delivery can, can allow us, this is something that was talked about yesterday as well, we may be able to tune our delivery to learning styles, and that's effectively mass customization. I think it also reduces some of the repetitive aspects of faculty-student interaction. These uh, frequently answered question postings that we have have been a very uh, interesting concept, chat rooms and the like. So there's some things where faculty time is, can be diverted, I guess you'd say, to other types of thing. And some of the repetitive aspects of faculty-student interaction can be taken over by IT. It increases the reach of mediated material. You know, our school has, I think, 18,000 alums. If any of them do dis, uh, lifelong learning, I'd like them to take it from Purdue not anywhere else. Um, IT enables distance product realization teams and enables this more, more realistic performance models in design and uh, process. I'd like to, to uh, now think about what I call some dislocation cases in businesses. So I'm, I'm sort of changing gears here and I want to step back and think about the impact of IT on some business sectors. And then toward the end, I'll try to bring it into our domain of engineering education, in particular residential university engineering education. And these are some case studies I'd like to share, talk with you a bit about. Encyclopedia Britannica, uh, your local retailer, car dealerships, insurance agents, and then ask the question about the residential university. So let's look at Encyclopedia Britannica. Now, anyone that grew up in the States, I'm assuming that if you grew up in the US, you had a set of encyclopedias on your bookshelf at your house. And I, you know, my guess is no one here didn't have that. Now, how many one here has bought a set of encyclopedias in, say, the last 10 years? I, I don't believe anyone will raise their hand. So that's a very interesting case study. Very big business. Uh, every American home, I believe, that had kids whose, where their parents envisioned that they would go to college had a set of encyclopedias. And that's gone from 100% market penetration to zero. And it all happened just a few years back. So what, what was going on there? Well, one thing is that the information conveyed in the product or the service slash product was tied up in the physical books. So effectively, we all, all American kids had about a meter of encyclopedias in a bookshelf at home. They used a parental guilt trip as a, a very effective marketing tool. Do you want your kid to be behind his or her peers? No. Then buy these encyclopedias. We all bought. My parents bought. 
Now, what began to happen is, you know, not too many years back, Bill Gates went to, my guess is, Bill Gates went to Encyclopedia Britannica and said, why don't we work together? And they said, no, thanks. And he said, fine, I'll just give away encyclopedias then on CD-ROMs. And that's effectively what happened. Sales went to zero overnight. So interesting case study. Let's look at another one. Your local retailer. I think I'll tie, I can tie this to IT, but let's think about it. Basically, the, this is the small mom and pop shop. They have a relatively small selection, rel relatively small amount of things in stock. The proprietor carries the information content on these products. You went in, you chat with them. They know what's available, what they have. They know a lot about their products. You know, you think of the hardware store. And there's certainly some social value, some community in that uh, local shop. But what, what's happened, as you know, is the larger stores and the malls have begun to impact that. And you see they're not totally disappeared, but there's certainly an impact on that business sector. Now, one of the things that you might think about is, you know, why is that? Well, one way to think of it is, as, as the malls are there and the Walmarts, basically the information available to the consumer has increased greatly. And so we don't really rely on that proprietor to give us information about the products. So that's one aspect, probably, of what's gone on. Think if you were in the car dealership business. And think of the trends, you know, many years ago, if you think of what's happened in the last 20 years, I think you see a trend toward greater selection with sort of fewer stops. So you think of auto malls where all the dealers that are competitors are clustering together in one place. I think certainly in, in, in the cities I've lived in, you find single dealers that are in. Now they have not only Fords, but they have GMs and international cars as well. So single dealers with pro a wider and wider selection of products. Now there is this, some people enjoy making the deal and enjoy the face-to-face -face battle with the car dealer and the information that they tell you about. There's probably some value in physically test driving these cars, but my guess is I would not want to be in the car dealership business depending on walk-in sales anymore. I think the internet opens up so much information that we don't really rely on the car dealership for any of that. We know exactly what they pay for the cars and we know all the cars that you can get and when you can get them. The very last little case study I'll talk about is sort of your local insurance agents. There's a major dislocation going on in this business as well. Uh, you might, if you think back 20 or 30 years or something, I guess you'd say your, your friendly all-state agent, your local agent, was the one that helped you if you had a loss of, of a car or a flood or a, a tornado or hail or something like that. They came out, they helped you, and there was that sort of information. Let me tell you how we can sort this out. Now, I think in time, you've gradually seen a bifurcation in that. I don't know, you know, the last time I got hit in my car, I drove it to a claim station who looked at it. My agent was never involved. Now, I didn't like the way the, uh, the whole thing was handled because it turns out I ran into somebody that had insurance from the same company. And instead of arguing about it, they just blamed us both. And I didn't think that was quite right, so I called my a agent. And basically, my agent said, well, I don't have anything to do with that. You're, ta you know, you're talking to the wrong group. I'm the front end. You need to talk to some other division. So, so what's happened is that the whole industry has been broken apart. The claims is one place. If you want to argue about how they handled your claim, you don't call your agent. You call somebody else. So, and I think if you read the paper, you see major changes that are going on in these large companies. And I guess the value added is in question. What's, what does that local agent provide to you? So again, uh, I think... I read something that Allstate was you know, doing something with a huge fraction and effectively laying off a huge fraction of their local agents. Okay, so what are the themes in this, in these case studies? And I hope they relate to what we're talking about today. Well, all of them had that in the beginning there were physical aspects of the product or the service. And the information content was integrally tied with the physical content. Think about the encyclopedias. All the information was in the physical books. Same with the 
car dealership, the information that the dealer or the agent conveys to you is tied with the fact that you go to the shop and see the cars or go to the hardware store and see the, see the material. Now the dislocation occurs when you can split the information content from the physical content of the product. I would say anyone that's working in a sector where your physical content and your information content can be split, I would beware. Now what's another sector that has exactly that potential? That's us. Think of a residential university. Well, our value added is the education and learning that our students extract from the experience on campus. We facilitate it by faculty, and historically, sage on the stage, good lectures, large classrooms, large physical plant, lecture halls, labs, student unions, dorms, study areas, all of that physical infrastructure that supports the learning environment that we think is important. But here's the question. Can the students, can our society separate the information content of what we deliver from that physical plant? And if so, we're in trouble. So, a sobering thought maybe, but not a, not a new one for you. So what do we do about that? So how does a, a residential university like Purdue and like the schools that are represented here deal with this? I think we, and, and it's what we're working on, is we are working very hard to define exactly which educational experiences are really value adding. And I'm looking for the ones where the physical and the information content cannot be separated. And, and I believe we need to focus on those very quickly because the University of Phoenix and other folks are going to come after that sector of our business where you can separate the physical from the information content. So where is physical presence not equal to wireless presence? Where is presence not the same as telepresence? So those are the things that I believe and at Purdue we're trying to focus on. So those activities, hands-on labs, I believe are one of those. Now, you might argue that I can do with haptic interfaces. You might argue that I can do virtual labs that do everything that a hands-on lab does. I think in my heart of hearts, I, I don't believe that. Now, it may be that I'm putting my head in the sand, but that's an interesting discussion. Will we ever be able to do with virtual labs what you learn when I talked yesterday about taking apart a, a, a lawnmower engine and putting it back together every piece by piece and starting it and getting it to run. We're taking part of a washing machine. Can we really re replicate that with virtual labs? Good question. I think a lot of the, you know, I think mentoring, I think the faculty to student mentoring, that relationship is one thing that you cannot do in a distance mode the same as you can do in, with physical presence. That's probably debatable. You know, some folks are going to be telling the world that's not true. They're going to be telling the world, you don't need to go. You don't need to send your child to MIT or to Purdue. They can stay at home or at least kick them out of the house, move them to an apartment nearby. But they can get everything they need wireless. So I think that's not true. Collaborative learning, I believe there's a lot of the learning environment that involves working with other students. That's the dorm. That's the midnight discussions. That, I believe, is a part of our physical plant and the physical and learning environment that cannot really be separated from the information content. So when I think about building a new wing on the ME building, which we're trying to do, I think about how can I make that place the, the place, the, one, the best place in the country and the world where this full educational environment can be experienced. I want the students to be fighting their parents to say, send me to Purdue, because I think it's going to get more and more competitive as time goes on. Now, that might be a little more pr provocative, but I guess the question is, what do we do with those aspects of our, we're not a business, but those aspects of our enterprise that are subject to dislocation? One approach is say, we just give those up. We're going to focus all our energy on those few activities where we truly provide a value that can't be split between the physical and the information content. 
So I'm not proposing this, but that might say, let's get out of the internet web course delivery development. Turn that over to the folks that are going to go after that anyway, and let's spend all our time on these things. You know, I want to be the supplier of choice for the labs when all those distance education things realize that we can't get it across without a lab, then I think they'll be sending them to MIT and Purdue to get that component of their experience. So I'm not exactly, we're not actually doing that. We're doing a lot to develop web courses, but that would be one approach that a business would take. You know, if you see a sector that's going to be eaten up, you just spin that off and let them fight on that battleground by themselves, and we'll focus on our core value added. So, Great. be you willing to answer questions, or maybe that's a, a piece of the discussion for the, the, the panel no, as well? The, the panel will be on the slide issue, so let's have questions now. John? Uh, Dan, I, um, I think maybe um, to your last point, you might want to consider what businesses consider um, something called asset management. And if you did that, maybe you'd see that how to leverage all of these things as opposed to disposing some and keeping others. Because really, what you're really talking about is what are these assets right. and how to best use them. Yeah. And, and surely the educational content is going to come from Purdue faculty and MIT faculty. So there, so might be, there might be other business academic interaction which could allow for that leverage. Right, like we chatted last night. I have a question uh, follow up to virtual laboratories. Mm -hmm. And have you done any quantitative assessment of your success with them at all? Not, we have not in a, in a scientific way. We have anecdotal evidence. So, my anecdotal evidence is just sort of negative. Is that, you know, by for an engine, we've had to add streaming audio in order to give people enough feedback. Okay. So are there like information that tells metrics for virtual laboratories? And my, my feeling would be you cannot do it. So my, my anecdotes go along with that, though it's certainly not a, a, an unbiased representative sample. And I also know that, you know, I probably bias a sample myself and then, and, uh, and, and who you hear from. But so I, I think that's an important thing, I mean, to, to decide what the metrics are. And I thought the work we heard yesterday from Dave Wallace, I guess it was, is, is not on virtual labs, but the idea of how do you assess the effectiveness is a very important thing. There was a... Uh, yeah, the, some of the comments you made and some of the points you brought out are very good points. The one thing that uh, is not there that separates for the use brokers and MITs from the scenario presented is that um, <coughs> part of it, what, what we do at institutions like what we call research universities is really research and graduate education. And uh, to date, graduate education really depends on interaction amongst the people, between professors and students, between students and between professors, and between all of these people. And uh, so since much of what we do, in fact, uh, the fact that we're emphasizing undergraduate education so much in our department, is so much taken to the strain in some ways. And, uh, but uh, the fact of the matter is that uh, we assemble people together so that indeed through the intellectual endeavor, we create things that really cannot be conveyed over the wire because it has not been codified. In fact, by the time we are ready to sent over the wire, it may be old knowledge. So graduate education would not be up to date. So that's a very important reason why schools like yours and MIT's and whatnot will survive and do well. So uh, about your point about uh, letting someone else worry about transmitting existing information is a very good point that bias us and this is something we need. talked about 
out to some scenario. One, I was wondering if uh, your remarks on this idea of pulling together people from that are the leaders in certain fields together uh, in a distance learning way to form a degree. So in other words, you pull the best from this institution and that institution, and that becomes the university. Is that out there? Well, before I moved back to Purdue, I was at Arizona State, and there's an organization called the Western Governors University. And so that, in fact, is trying to do exactly what you say. And the, I can tell you the legislators believe that the scenario you laid out can, in fact, happen and are moving in that direction. And I guess you'd say competing with the universities for the funds that would allow you to do that. So I think, you know, and when I said spinoff, that was, you know, overstated. But that's another way to look at what you're thinking. It may be that the top schools want to get together on that piece of our enterprise and, and do something proactive and get ahead of the curve. And so I, I've thought about that. I guess I haven't started. I mean, I haven't started that conversation with anyone, but I'm interested in the conversation because I think uh, that's something we may want to want to do. Every time I hear about the, the top universities getting together, I'm reminded a bit of the European Union, where you know there's all these countries that each one has a great history and so on, and they want to unite, but they still want to maintain their individuality and their culture and so on. So do you have some comments about that? Yeah, I, I'm not. I, I, don't, I don't believe it would be an easy, easy process. And, uh, you know, it may be a different, different organizing group and, and subsets of, of the various ones. I'm not sure I'm, I'm you know, recommending that or, or, or pushing that, but I think it is something to, to think about. You know, and I, you know, we have, as I mentioned, all of us have alums who are, are loyal and so certainly I'm not excited about giving up my alumni base for continuing learning to any of our, as, as much as I respect Berkeley. You know, that's not something I'm excited about either. So it, it will be like the EEU sort of thing, but it would be a long process. But I think what we need to make sure is we don't do nothing and then find out that we're in big trouble and can't reverse it. One more question. It occurred to me that context that you use to describe the, the issue is, is basically a market share problem, a fear of declining market share. And uh, it, it occurred to me also that maybe the way of looking at it is to try to expand the served market. And it seems to me that if, if the footprint of impact of the research university could extend on both ends, into the high school and into the early career, then that might be a way of looking at the student life cycle differently. And it might I, be a solution. I have a new solution. Yeah, and I think, I think all of us are working with the high schools, pushing everything down that direction. And, and I think we're all thinking about it. So that, that's, a, that's a good point. And that is true. I was kind of painting a scenario where you'd say the residential bodies are going to decrease. You know, that'd be the worst case scenario. And I, but I don't think that's probably going to happen. I think the person, students that go to the, the, the major universities and live there are probably still going to. Okay, one more, one more question. I really think the fundamental issue is going to be on academics. Um, the residential university system is extremely expensive. Uh, apparently, for a family to educate their uh, children, and uh, the apparent free cost of price you pay for, quote, distance type learning is, is there's such a huge gap between the two that, that I maintain that ultimately be the, the fundamental driving force which, which would make residential universities have to stand up and figure out a way that they can offer something at, at, a, at a far more cost effective. Or, or convince the world that the value in, or focus on those aspects that clearly add value to a residential university. Every one of your examples was the world was not swayed by personal contact with the local community, etc. So 
Well, Pur Purdue's ME uh, enrollment's been flat for 20 years, and it's capped for 20 years. So I guess I haven't seen the arguments lose, but I am trying to be prepared for the fact that it's going to get tougher. Okay. So there might be, we have a large number of departments who got an undergraduate student. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, let's uh, thank Professor Rillman again. <laughs> Last on our agenda is our panel discussion. Um, it's listed on the program as uh, uh, the role of mechanical engineering in the information technology revolution. And I would like us to interpret this broadly, uh, just to talk about all sorts of applications of information technology and mechanical engineering, mechanical engineering in, sorry, information technology and mechanical engineering, and vice versa. Um, uh, and, you know, that was your chance to speak up. I'd like to, we should get a discussion going. Our panelists are going to be um, uh, Irv Salmin from Ford, um, and then uh, our speakers, three of our speakers from this morning, Professor Tomazuka, uh, Professor Hunter, and Professor Barbas Tafas. So if I could ask you gentlemen to ascend the stage here. Um, now, uh, 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 Irv Salmin is the only person who hasn't uh, uh, spoken yet. Actually, is he here? Is he here? <laughs> okay. Well, if he's not here, then he won't speak. <coughs> That's strange. Okay. So he just stepped up. It's possible he just stepped up. Yeah. Well, if he's not, we'll, we'll um, why don't we get ourselves going then? Um, and uh, uh, so, if people want to say a few words to, to some of their feelings about things, or not, as you as you please, and then we can just have a discussion. We have some of them. Yeah. I'm going to start with an old and embattled question. Should we be requiring a programming language of our undergraduates, and if so, what? Oh, there's a good one. <laughs> Anybody want to? Where's Sunny Sue? That's a question. She's on the. Yeah. Do, do, do you want to address that, Sunny? You're on the, the university committee. Yeah, I didn't take questions directly. Um, I am uh, teaching an undergraduate course at sophomore or freshman level. In the net course, okay. Um, last year there were about 20 mechanical engineering students. Okay. This year there are like over 40 students, and it is not a required course in our department. It's open only as an elective, and they all want to learn about this technology. And the student evaluations, the evaluation from the students that I got, they always say that this is something that they want to really see in the curriculum because they feel like they are really in the top notch, in the forefront of the technology and they want to see how this is going to be linked to mechanical engineering. Uh, so one thing that, of course, the course is elementary, I cannot go into all the specific application, like tele-robotics or telemedicine, or this kind of application. <coughs> but I do hinder at the fact that the internet now is more than just a tool or a network to retrieve information, but it's about to control machines to connect with physical objects. And in that course, I did uh, tell, uh, teach them about Java programming languages, XML, that will be used uh, in a lot of medical databases. So this kind, kind of thing that, that we can teach the mechanical engineering students without giving the whole course about C++ or object-oriented programming. So that's the my answer to your question. I, I, I think so, sadly we don't teach that uh, programming language in traditional sense, but I think we, we, we are still requiring a course is essentially to think about something more like what solving, what, what the computation is. And also I think, I believe, I'm not directly involved in, but I believe that, that uh, we teach also C, I think at um, the, the lower division level. Another thing I think really is a student is interested in certain language like Java. It's, uh, one of my colleagues is giving a new course on the Java programming application. And I think he, he was very surprised that uh, he, it's, uh, it, this is the first time he's giving, and uh, it easily went over the enrollment limit. So the, the instead of the, 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 from a faculty point of view, whether we should be teaching or not, certainly I think students are interested in learning some language aspect. And I think there's a, probably there's a, to some extent it listens to customer what they want. And I think, the, again, the, the for ME department, somebody teaching Java language and getting lots of student enrollment 
it's a very, very good thing for us. Okay. And MIT is a civil engineer, right? Civil engineers. By far the most popular course is their course 100, uh, 100 C++. Oh, uh, you had a comment, yeah. Yes, my name is Martin Bouillet from the University of Sherbrooke in Canada. I think uh, one of the conclusions of this weekend's meeting is that information technology is going to be very important. It's important now and going to be more and more important in the future. Uh, and we've, we've been ad adding uh, courses piecemeal into the curricula, but what we have done, we, what we have not done yet is integrating that to the, the training of mechanical engineers. Because in the past, we used to say that fluids and solids would be important. And now we're saying that IT is important, but I have not seen it integrated as these past subjects have been. What's, what's the future of that? Maybe you have something to say about that. Well, I'll make a, a few comments um, related to teaching instrumentation, where we have the challenge of integrating uh, optics with mechanics, with electronics, with chemistry, and also normally biology. Uh, one of the problems is, uh, I mean, certainly in those courses, we expect students to have a, a basic numeric language, such as Java or BASIC or C++. Uh, but we also find it highly necessary that they have some symbolic uh, capability. But it goes way beyond that, because uh, I'll, I'll just give you an example of a challenge that involves uh, multiple disciplines. Uh, imagine you have a conducting polymer that is clear. The, the polymer is clear, but it's also an actuator. So it's electrochemically activated to contract, and it's acting as a lens. So there you've got an issue of needing to model, normally with a continuum model, the electrical activation of that polymer, the chemistry involved with it, the fact that there's mechanics uh, causing this material to contract, which has an optical consequence, namely that it's a lens. And because the efficiency is not 100%, you've got a thermal management problem as well. So the problem is that the existing modeling tools, be they lump parameter or continuum tools, think of your standard finite element packages. Uh, you, you'll have one package that will be appropriate for mechanics and thermal, but normally there'll be no optics and no electronic phenomena. Or then you go to some electronic finite element or continuum modeling package, uh, and it'll perhaps include ma ma magnetic phenomena, but not optics. You go to optics and there's no electronics. So one of the problems at the moment is that as we go to more and more sophisticated systems involving information manipulation as well as energy manipulation and transformation, the existing modeling tools are rather fractionated and are not well tied together. And I see that as a, as a tremendous challenge to put together very generalized uh, modeling tools where simulations and virtual environments and so on can be created, which go across these different material domains. Actually, uh, uh, Harry, if, if I could make one more comment. There's uh, one more area where similar challenges exist, and that is MEMS. Uh, MEMS has, is, uh, you know, microelectromechanical systems and has kind of been taken over by electrical engineering departments, if you look around, right? But yet MEMS is a very good example of integrating requirements from electrical, mechanical, and even optical properties, right? Optical MEMS. So again, you have the same challenges that Ian was mentioning. And then the question is, what do we do, that, what do we want our students to do? Do we want them to just use natural computers as, you know, other disciplines, to doctors, lawyers? I mean, we communicate with them with emails nowadays, right? Is this what we only want them to do, or do we want them to go beyond and contribute to modeling, contribute to, or even new, uh, even more fundamental new advances? Uh, Harry had a question. Yeah, I just want to follow up on the uh, uh, questions regarding how IT uh, is to be measured with the uh, mechanical engineering, because it's very uh, critical questions. And just uh, echoing back the, uh, for the Hunter's comment, uh, this has been a really important issue for us in the double lab. Um, I, I think the uh, uh, as Dan mentioned that the uh, uh, the data 
moving to information and then transforms the knowledge and finite wisdom. And that provides a very good uh, uh, kind of a framework uh, because the, uh, we are mechanical engineering, uh, you know, focusing mostly on the uh, knowledge and the wisdom part. And our, our the mainstream uh, uh, discipline has been uh, developed in, the, in that way. But it's a time that we need to have uh, some new format of a representation of these stuff and the way that uh, pieces of uh, uh, info, uh, the knowledge to be used. For instance, the uh, you know, time is a very critical factor. We have to make very critical design decisions overnight. Uh, E-commerce is a ma major driving factor in doing that. And uh, that's actually giving us the uh, big challenge as to, you know, we can't do a slow uh, dwelling on the something, but uh, we have to use these things very effectively. And I see that the traditional mechanical engine haven't been prepared for this change yet. As far as the representation of format is concerned, um, I don't think that it's a very well uh, you know, prepared for it. I think uh, uh, Professor Young Hunter has developed a very interesting course. It's called, uh, well, you have changed the course name, but uh, uh, 2.131. It's called Advanced uh, Instrumentation and Measurement. Uh -huh. That uh, is heavily uh, uh, based on uh, simulation modeling and uh, uh, connected to a real data acquisition, which is very important part. And uh, that's uh, one form of a uh, you know, very important uh, uh, style of uh, new mechanical engineering. And uh, I think the, uh, uh, we haven't materialized that in the uh, broader you know, undergraduate subject yet, but uh, our students uh, uh, have to learn these tools, and then they may find some ways of using it for the future career development. So I think the uh, connection is, is very uh, obvious, although we haven't done that. Uh, but you're talking about all e-commerce and stuff, but uh, we have to look at the issues beyond just uh, you know, you know, merchandise and the purchasing stuff, uh, but some uh, important engineering level issues uh, it hasn't been explored yet. And that's a kind of a point that we, we make a strong connection between the IT and the mainstream and mechanical engineering. some uh, enormous challenges ahead because there's a sense in which you could say that the easy pickings are over and a lot of the really interesting uh, research and commercial systems in the future are systems and they're going to be drawing upon tools and techniques from, you know, from optics which has classically been in physics through electronics and mechanics and new materials and information processing and so on. And so the problem is how do we train the sort of re renaissance style systems level uh, designer and scientists and engineers who can handle these sorts of systems. And uh, I think the problem is uh, unless we can increase the efficiency with which learning occurs or with which uh, information is acquired, we've got a terrible time uh, allocation problem. Um, and I think we've got to make some hard judgments as to which uh, areas of knowledge are perhaps to be left out in order that we progress forward. I'll give, a, I'll give an example. Uh, all of you, either in your calculators or in your favorite computer languages, will use the basic trigonometric functions, sine, cos, tan, and so on. How many of you know 
algorithmically how the how the uh, that particular function is coded uh, in in your favourite uh, calculator or in your favourite computer language. Could you put your hand up? I don't know because you told me. <laughs> okay. Um, then um, you know that the favourite uh, and for some of you who didn't see it, um, probably about 10% of uh, individuals put their hands up. Um, for those of you who don't know, it's normally a rational Chebyshev uh, expansion, uh, where the objective function is not least squares, it's a min-max criteria. Now, very, very few students know that now, whereas 20 years ago, you were taught that. When you were learning uh, about writing compilers for typical languages, you would know that. And the same is said for, for the Fourier transform. It used to be that uh, you, you, you showed your metal by having coded a Fourier transform from scratch and then having done it once, you were then free to use to plunder some package for uh, future use of the Fourier transform. Nowadays we have to ask ourselves, do we have time to show students the elegance of setting up your butterflies when in the Fourier transform butterflies in a certain way, or do we have the time to expose students to the fine detail uh, in a singular value decomposition algorithm? Um, and if we do spend time on singular value decomposition and all the details and how that magnificent algorithm is implemented, we lose the ability to teach some other uh, concepts. So I think we've, we've got a challenge in terms of making these trade-offs. Um, but I'd hope that at the same time we don't assume that the efficiency is constant. I would hope that there are, via using new technologies, methods of increasing the efficiency and speed with which information is acquired. How do you define efficiency in learning? Well, that's a, a very difficult thing because at the moment there's a sense in which if I went into my laboratory, used uh, a multimeter, which instead of having uh, five significant uh, places, uh, had none. In other words, I perhaps used my own hair as an electrostatic uh, uh, voltmeter or something like that. Um, you would ask me, what's the reliability of that measurement? What's the validity of that measurement? What are the signal to noise ratios? In general, we don't ask those same questions of the process of transmitting information. We don't have the measurements. There's a sense in which, in a scientific uh, sense, it's a very primitive, you know, our measuring tools are very primitive. And, um, you know, Dave Wallace and others are, are attempting to improve those tools. But uh, the, the, our problem is that we have great difficulty even quantifying what we mean by something like efficiency. So all I can do is fall back to anecdotal uh, feelings about it. But I do know that in many of the discussions that go on about how we allocate time to different subject areas, there's almost an implicit assumption that the efficiency with which information is acquired is constant. And I don't think that's the case. I think by, uh, it's, it's very, very clear from uh, the behavioral learning literature in animals, for example, that you can craft situations where the speed with which an animal will learn a simple task, the efficiency with which they acquire that information can be orders of magnitude different if you set the environment up appropriately. Uh, whether or not humans are subject to the same principles, I don't know, but it just strikes me that we have to be looking for ways to speed up the rate with which information is acquired. It's part of the complication is if you think levels of learning, it's easier to assess in the lower levels, which is the training example. But I think it's harder and harder as you move to knowledge and not the chain levels of learning to assess. Yeah, yeah and in fact, fo following up on your point before, um, we have the concept, for example, in the Advanced Instrumentation and Measurement course uh, that as Nam was saying before, we're exposing the students to the culture of a research environment that by actually running a course, not in a departmental laboratory, but in a real research laboratory, uh, where things are being fabricated, measurements are being made, things are not working all the time, um, as they might in a departmental laboratory, you're exposed to this culture of research. Now, how do we quantify something like that? <laughs> I think it's very difficult. But somehow it's special. 
and distinguishes us from what might be transmitted across the web, for example. Sorry, I inter interrupted you, Nam. Just uh, in response to Alan's question here, I think we are really trying to measure how much people retain certain knowledge so they can use it. It's not simply transmission of it. And if you look at it like that, you know, someone who has this much knowledge will be able to add so much given certain amount of information. Someone else who knows this much will be able to add a lot more given the same amount of information. So that, that means it's sort of like an exponential function. The only way you can measure that is coefficient that, the, of the exponential function. And yet we are trying to treat this like a linear thing, thinking that there is, uh, everybody has will acquire the same increment. And uh, so what we have to figure out is what the e to the ax is, what a is. Uh, AT or whatever the case might be, right? And I think that's why it is so difficult to deal with um, talking as measurement of uh, the teaching efficiency or learning efficiency because it's not a linear function. You, and then every student who has different <coughs> level of understanding or level of knowledge base will acquire different amounts given the same amount of information. And that makes uh, this whole subject very complicated. Actually, I would take a pretty radical position on this, that part of our job, of course, is to teach the students very fundamental things, and there's a certain number of things that they have to learn, but part of our job is also to teach them how to learn. And uh, I think very often we make this mistake, where we try to pack as much information as possible in our lectures, in, the, in our syllabi, and so on. And what we miss then is that the students actually get swept by all this, and they, they return very little. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I mean, if I look back at my own background, the, the topics that I learned most from were topics where the actual content was very sort of uh, carefully picked, but not sort of universal. But there were very uh, some of the topics that were very well done, very deeply done. And in addition, the instructor had the intelligence to arouse my curiosity about the topic. So then, you know, in addition to whatever I was doing in the homeworks and so on and so forth, I would also go and look elsewhere. Because if you think about it, we don't have to transmit all the information to the students ourselves. Now, the, you know, books have existed for hundreds of years, and that's where the information used to lie to to exist. And now we have the web and all kinds of others, for, you know, CD-ROMs and so on and so forth. So, uh, on the other hand, if we manage to arouse the motivation and the curiosity of the students, I think we could, we could achieve better efficiency. Uh, and I think this, this is how this can be done. Can I actually ask Professor Thomas here yeah. to comment on that? I mean, you have this beautifully crafted graduate program yeah. of electronic control. Control. I, th I think control is an interesting area to watch because if I look back my 25 or 30 years as from student to now, I think that the control area always evolved with uh, information technology. And so when, when I, I came to the United States, in fact, I think I, I, I have already mastered quite a bit of control theory. But the first thing I experienced, I think taking a course 2.151, okay, that MIT was still there. Okay, so now there, there was an, this homework assignment okay, to check step response. Okay, so, Okay, now, Laplace transformation, inverse transformation, time response, and so forth. I thought I knew, but the first time when I really got some good feeling was with 11.30, solve the homework problem, and actually the computer started plotting the step response, okay? So I think the, the, the information technology or use of the computer, if it's used in the right way, it really is enhanced how the student would be understanding we cannot really say that, okay, because information technology is there, we cannot become a slave of the information technology. Everything is done by now computer, whether we don't have to teach analytical aspect. That's a total mistake. The, the control theory, we still teach some of the, the very old graphical technique which was invented when the information technology was not there. But by, by some of those techniques really helps us develop good tuition into the system, engineering system. Some of even the so what people call modern control theory, there are a lot of matrix involved. Just when I'm watching matrix, I can follow the theory and I can come up to that that's right. Okay, but I don't get good feeling when I get some numerical work done and see how that some certain parameter affect the system performance. That's when I really get the theory 
really I am fully un I understand and make it a sort of working knowledge. Okay, so it really is an important aspect to really combine real fundamental things and utilize computer to really enhance the understanding. I was wondering if any of you would comment on this idea of virtual laboratory in the following way. We, we talked about one of the important things at, at university is the hands-on, the mentoring, the interaction. Now, the virtual laboratory has the potential to replace somehow that. Do we, does anybody have any evidence to suggest that that's uh, uh, as effective as, as a hands-on laboratory? Well, uh, I don't personally have any uh, evidence to the extent that we've operationally defined what the variables are and we have good signal-to-noise ratio and the measurement techniques for acquisition of information via direct interacting with interaction with phenomena versus that that you might get across uh, uh, in some virtual environment. However, uh, what we can say are there are certain phenomena that at the moment, the technology does not allow for transmi transmission. For example, when uh, you take the conducting polymer example that I gave before, up to 10 to the 7 amps per square meter, um, the smell that occurs as it burns is not something that currently is convenient to transmit across the web. So we have good tactile inf interfaces now. We have very good. 3D visual interfaces, but for example, the chemical uh, uh, display technology is relatively primitive. So when you go across different sensor, sensory modalities that are involved when you really got your hands in on something, you're detecting the, the moisture content in materials, you're feeling the slipperiness of bearings and so on and so forth. Uh, you're smelling the consequence of bearings being burnt out or conducting polymers being overloaded. Uh, the, uh, these are things which, with time, there will be presumably good, uh, uh, good ways of being able to transmit that via a remote interface, um, but not at the not at the moment. So, uh, I I actually don't think that we should make a clear uh, dichotomy between the two. Um, I think in many teaching scenarios, you want both running at the same time. So, for example. Uh, uh, we and others in our department are conceiving of courses where you have wearable heads-up displays and wearable computers, so your hands are free to interact with machine tools and other tools, and where the display technology is, in one instance, see-through so that you can see what you're doing, or when you need additional instruction, uh, that information comes up in that same display. So I, I see mixtures where real laboratory work is being uh, undertaken at the same time as portions of it is done virtually. So we need to develop web-based scratch and sniff technology. <laughs> 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 no, 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 um, no I, I, really, I really mention this because I always get a lot of guff work, but I actually have an undergraduate at Harvard and uh, you're not supposed to say that. I'm like, where? But, <laughs> 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 and, uh, at, at a university in Boston. And, uh, there they let you, in the physics department, you could either take a lab course or they would let you work on an experiment instead of working on doing a lab course. And I went and I worked for Norman Ramsey in, um, in France on his cold neutron experiments for part of the reasons that he actually won the Nobel Prize a few years ago. And so I never took a, a laboratory course as an undergraduate. And what I had to teach the first semester I was here under Ian, I uh, taught 2.671 lab, which was a laboratory. And I was, I found it, it was such a different experience from what a real experiment is like. I mean, in many respects it was better because of course the techniques are being taught in a systematic way. But I felt that it, it really, you know, this is not even a virtual experiment, right? This is an actual laboratory where you're, you're putting stress gauges on things and stuff like that. I felt much of the experience of actually being out there doing research was really lost because you're being presented the stuff, if you do everything right, it happens in the way it's supposed to. This is a problem that's even worse with virtual reality stuff, but most of the experience of an experiment is sitting there frustrated, typically for months at a time, okay, when you can't figure out what's going on, trying everything, right, trying to think of all the things you didn't think of in order to make things work, 
And, and somehow I think that if we actually want to educate our students so that they are these kind of renaissance people that uh, Ian was suggesting, I think that, that going to the point where they're in a, a more, more controlled and less sensory rich environment is going in exactly the wrong direction in terms of teaching them the skills of imagination and dealing with the real world that they're going to need. They're going to actually do something good later on. And that's, you know, that's just my prejudice on it. Uh, I have a quick comment from the, from the panel, from the audience, about the impact or implication of IT on one traditional aspect of mechanical engineering, which is design and manufacturing. We know that the IT facilitates the universal and instantaneous access and dissemination of information, in this case, the design and processing information. And that give a new life of a discipline like concurrent engineering or a collaborative engineering. So I'm wondering if MIT, UC Berkeley, Purdue, or other institutions have incorporated the IT into that kind of a discipline. Yes, yes Andrew. Yes. to concurrent design. Uh, in my research, we're working on uh, haptic systems. Uh, we've built a three-dimensional, the first fully three-dimensional haptic system, actually, uh, to do uh, toolpath generation and to design objects in a CAD system. So that's really on, on, the, on the fringe of IT. So I think there's, at MIT, at Berkeley, at Stanford, there's the, uh, the CDR, the Center for uh, Design Research, has done a lot of work in uh, agents, using internet agents to do concurrent design. So there's actually a lot of work of in IT, in fact, I would say that's the first area where IT made an impact is in design and manufacturing because it was the most convenient way to disperse information. But I also wanted to make another comment about uh, the question that was asked earlier about uh, experiments and can we get rid of experiments and have virtual experiments. Um, as, as Ian uh, pointed out, uh, we've had some trouble. You know, you can't completely remove the visceral ex uh, experience of being present in exper at an experiment. So at MIT, we are trying to find ways to uh, do the uh, lecture delivery by the internet, but the experiments more physically in the lab. But one thing that uh, Professor Mary Boyce did was portable experiments, which is take-home experiments, so that you can put together small kits, uh, for example, tension test specimens that you can break at home uh, and measure at, at home. Um, similarly, there are kits that are put together for uh, the uh, 2670 project in, uh, I'm sorry, the six, in, in electrical engineering, there's a project where they can actually build electronics at home. So that may be another way to make experiments portable uh, and maybe address the same question. All right. Um, I think uh, the kind of question that the how we uh, uh, University of Bahati, uh, uh, uh defend ourselves uh, in, in the face of uh, IT uh, revolutions, certainly we lose uh, some of the undergraduate programs. Uh, uh, to be replaced by that, and how we find our niche market. It seems to me that it's a really ill-posed uh, question to some extent, because the technology side is uh, ever increasing. And as uh, Neil pointed out, the huge gap in the cost that can't uh, uh, beat. Um, on the other hand, uh, I, I think the real important issue here is it's not the kind of stuff uh, you know that uh, uh, our kids uh, uh, can do uh, because of having a, a large amount of information. Uh, but here's the uh, you know the one critical case is really a research part, and uh, I I confess that I do have several of my students having learning not a learning disability but the research disability, <laughs> and even MIT students who pass the qualifying exam having. Uh, research disability. And uh, many of them are smart kids, and they, they know a lot. And then as a matter of fact, and I, I, I see that they, over the past, past several years, uh, the collecting information is very uh, easier. And then they, 
uh, swearing uh, you know, every evening uh, in front of uh, you know, internet and then they learn a lot. But, but you know, doing some research is not kind of stuff. And sometimes I ask them, uh, put all the you know, stuff that, uh, aside, just to take a pad and pen, and uh, just to concentrate. And those uh, you know, students sometimes are having a sort of a difficulty to concentrate. And then, of course, the uh, future leaders should be able to deal with the large amount of information, yet they must be able to concentrate on one thing. But in the course of uh, uh, educating these uh, younger people, I sometimes <coughs> see that the uh, not the IT, but the DIT is better than <laughs> exposing to, uh, them to many pieces of information. So sometimes I request them not to read, not to explore, not to learn, but, but the information you have is just good enough. Just look at yourself, uh, trust yourself, and then th think about the stuff uh, that we already discussed. Uh, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. But I know in my experience, um, that's really pointing the, uh, one of the important uh, aspects, because uh, you know, creating something and uh, um, actually inventing something is really different. Of course, uh, broad knowledge is uh, very essential. And however, that doesn't, that's not, that may be some necessary condition, but uh, it's not sufficient. And, uh, and it's really lacking something. And then uh, when we plan the future uh, university like MIT, I think we should have uh, the kind of you know um, uh, good mechanisms in doing that too. This, this presentation using well, yesterday we saw a better person. He, he used the uh, uh, OHP, but uh, usually he's actually a chalk talker and uh, doesn't use really any IT technology. But just sketching uh, just a few uh, icon uh, or a few uh, equations, uh, so to speak. Uh, but, but that transmits a lot of uh, information. That at least the kind of a basic concept is better described by, you know, flipping around. The, I showed the, you know, about 100, uh, you know, uh, uh, view graphs last, uh, yesterday. But sometimes the set, set mode is better than <laughs> my mode. So that actually point out these sort of important things. And uh, you know, in the face of IT, what we uh, research institution and, and, and educational institution should convey to our students. And then that's really sort of, I you know, the joy of inventions and or creating something uh, based on our own knowledge. And uh, it's, I see that the uh, kind of stuff we, uh, we, we share with the students is really very much an emotional component or the kind of a sense or detection abilities uh, that the young pointed out, and of which are totally different direction from uh, IT uh, that I'm looking <coughs> procedure we have at MIT of having every undergrad do the same courses initially. Physics, math, chemistry, and effectively molecular biology. I think that's a great underpinning for almost any discipline. Secondly, the undergraduate research opportunity program, the Europe program that I think you're perhaps referring to, where students are exposed to real research laboratories from day one if they choose to. And I believe, now correct me if I'm wrong, but about 90% of our undergrads uh, do Europe's. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so in my laboratory, uh, we have a very strange situation, or strange uh, for most universities, where we have the same number of postdocs as we have PhD students, as we have master's students, as we have undergrads. Um, and it turns out that some of those undergrads uh, can be at times as effective as a master's or PhD student. Some of those kids, if you put them in the right environment, are incredibly creative and productive. And so they're not just there. Uh, to, uh, because I feel good about having undergrads, they are in fact productive. 
in a, in a research sense. Undergrads don't know that certain things can't be <laughs> Exactly. Right, that's, that's true. I, I think a good, I would second that, a good draw because it would couple of PhD students at some point. Yes. If they're motivated properly. they're <laughs> motivated properly, right. Uh, well, this will be the last uh, comment. With, with all of the emphasis going on now in K-12 on having computers in every classroom and 100% access to the internet, what are the panel's thoughts on what it will be like five years from now in terms of you know, the idea that you'll, you'll have students coming in, undergraduate, that maybe have 10 years of IT experience? Would you like to, to mm. comment on that? No, go ahead. Do you have to? I mean, will that change the, mm. the scope of the problem? It definitely will. It's, it's, if you wish, it's a matter of uh, satisfying the needs of our customers, but also taking care that we don't bore them. So, you know, if the kids come in and they already know how to program or they already know how to use computers, why should we bother doing that again? Unless there's particular gaps in their, you know, in, in their education, the way they come in. So there's no doubt that universities will evolve just just because of that uh, of course still when the kids they come in what they don't know is they don't know how to how to be in an environment where everyone else is equally smart as they are right they're coming from high school where you know they're probably the best in their class so you know they come here and they have to learn how to deal with that it is not going to fix all these things even if you think about virtual interactions and so on but uh, in terms of making our job easier in using IT, that's definitely true. What you're saying is definitely true. Oh, Ian, you want to, to add something? Okay, why don't we thank our panelists? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so uh, now I think I have to give you maybe closing remarks, and you're probably pretty tired of hearing me talk, so let me just make them brief to summarize what uh, uh, my perception of this meeting. Uh, so, now let me, let me do this by just talking about something I talked about briefly before. We have this thing called, the thing that the, the, the phenomenon that's really driving the information technology revolution is this Moore's Law phenomenon where, you know, I did it in sort of size, 10 to the minus 1 meters back in 1950, you know, 10 to the minus 7 meters now, all right, now down in uh, 2000 Y2K, and we don't know where we're going to be going in the future. If I draw the, of course, this tells me the size of components of things, but if I look at the power of a computer, naturally the power is proportional to the number of components you can put in a place, so the power is going in the opposite direction, you know, back from, uh, you know, a few 10 to the 3 to, to back in, in, say, 1950, where, you know, now we're 10 to the 12 or something like, well, something like, if we include our memory space, we're like that right now, the power of this is increasing rapidly. This is just a fact, okay? Along with this has come a, a huge increase in our capabilities. The kinds of things that uh, uh, Professor Thomas Zucker was talking about in mechatronics, our ability, you know, I would have not have thought it was a better idea in a Xerox machine to you know, have the paper handed off more times, okay? But if the Xerox machine is a smart Xerox machine, then maybe it is, and let's hope it is, because Xerox machines are about the most clunky things in the world. All right, <clears throat> um, now, let me give, I think that, that in some sense, this conference throws a very interesting light on Moore's Law. Now, uh, my first graduate degree was in uh, history and philosophy of science, so let me indulge me for a second while I take a historical and philo philosophical perspective on this phenomenon. Okay, our conference is about uh, uh, M E, right? M I T. And we heard a lot of how mechanical engineering from we heard some beautiful a beautiful talk with the initial one by Hopkin, the Tarosian, about how mechanical engineering had a big effect on the information technology revolution. And I think that that uh, this uh, conference has really thrown light on that. Now we've also we've heard even more in fact, considerably more about how the information technology revolution has had an effect on mechanical engineering. Now, <clears throat> you don't have to be teaching control theory to realize that this is a feedback loop, right? And so if, if there's kinds of things that happen here is that if we have, okay, we have the, uh, 
the rate of increase of improvement of information technology, DIT DT, is proportional to, is equal to uh, A times ME, all right, and DME DC, all right, is equal to B times IT, all right. What happens in this case? Well, let me see if I can. I, I think I, I'm really bad about doing algebra in public, but I think I can do this. This says ME and IT as a function of time, all right, they go as, let's see, a, E to the square root of AB times T, right? Both of them grow at this rate. You know, I just have to plug this equation into this other equation. I get the second order equation, and then I have to take the square root, et cetera, right? All right, it's an exponential explosion. That, in my mind, is what gives us Moore's Law. And Moore's Law is not, not just about information technology. I think we heard all this beautiful work from Ian Hunter, from uh, Peter So, from George Barbus Tafis, from, uh, uh, well, I, should, I could go through the list of all the people, about how other kinds of technologies, like instrumentation technologies, the precision of information technologies is also going down at an exponential rate, all right? There's Moore's Law. Moore's Law is not just a phenomenon about information technology. It's a phenomenon about all technology. And what this conference has largely been about has been taking advantage of all these things. So we have this exponential explosion. This is what's going on. And I feel that, that the, uh, the technical parts about this conference really illustrated this quite nicely. All right? Not to, not to pat, you know, pat us on the back or anything. I think it was, it's, it's just a fact about the world, right? It's not a fact about research at MIT. It's a fact about technology in general. All right. Now, then we had, for me, very provocative discussions of, uh, of education. I think Alex Darbloff really, <coughs> really brought up the, the, the question quite nicely. Do we uh, take a software engineer and teach them about mechanical engineering if we want something done? Or we do, do we take a mechanical engineer and teach them about software? Well, most of the observational evidence here is that you take some really smart people who are great technologists, and they're going to learn the software and make that happen. However, we also, I think, have a very good example, heard a very good example of an alternative, which is you take some people who are really good at software, and you take some people who are really good at engineering, and you have them collaborate together in a team. A superb example of that is the Auto ID Center, right? Where we have a world expert on the internet, Sunny Sue. We have world experts on creating you know, nanotechnology for tagging purposes, like Joe Jacobson. And with Sanjay Sarma, working, all working together to create a fantastic enterprise, right? Which would not have been conceivable a few years ago. Something where you could, in principle, tag every atom in the universe if you could find a place to stick the tag, right? Unfortunately, it's hard to stick tags on atoms. All right, now, then we had a very thoughtful set of discussions, uh, really pr primarily, I think, from all of you together, all right, about these issues of education. Um, I've been very happy to, I've learned a lot from this conference. Not only did I learn a lot about my colleagues' work, since I never hear about it except when I go to conferences, right, but, but I learned a great deal about uh, your attitudes and thoughts about the educational process. And I was very happy to see that there's a kind of a congruence here. I mean, we learned, we learned something I think is very important. That first of all, clearly, as, as Neil was saying, you know, education, distance education, the, the potential for information technology in education is vast, right? You could potentially have inexpensive education for lots of lots of people. But then we got uh, a great presentation from Dave Wallace, who, you know, in addition to just talking about this, has done these actual experiments, which is kind of nice to see data, where he pointed out that, okay, actually, all right, information technology, sorry, distance learning on its own via the web, and, you know, just sitting there going to lectures is kind of comparable, all right? Lectures are just the oldest form of, of information transmission. You know, they started in the University of Bologna in about 1,000 years ago. And a lecture then was, they didn't have printing presses, right? So the lecture was just the, the, the lecturer reading a book while everybody copied it down, OK? Just word for word. Now, it's changed not very much since then, right? That's a 1,000-year-old technology, essentially at work. Thank God we finally are getting something where we can enhance it. And Dave Wallace's work, I think, showed that if you take information technology and you combine it with teaching, put them together, you can make people do better. Unfortunately, however, it costs $500 per hour, 500 hours per hour, uh, per hour of lecture, right? It's a lot. 
right? It's going to be very expensive. The investment is going to be worth it in the long run because of the economies of scale that Neil was talking about. Okay. So I think that, you know, and then, then I think uh, Dan Hurlman, I think, gave a great, uh, a great uh, talk about this. I was amazed to find the kinds of, here the, the words that we've been hearing here at MIT talking about how we're going to combine information technology with engineering. <coughs> so word for word coming out of, of uh, someone from another university with a much larger mechanical engineering department, as I, I understand. <clears throat> okay, so I think that, you know, I, I'm, I'm willing to declare this conference a success, all right? Why did we have it? Well, clearly we wanted to show that at MIT we're, we're very concerned about information technology. The department has made a lot of investment in terms of faculty to work on it. I don't think there's any question that information technology is going to play a huge role in mechanical engineering in the future, as in all engineering, right? I don't, it's not it's really something to debate about. And let, so let me just fi fi uh, finish up. And you know, we're going to be there to see it. It's, these are exciting times to live in. Let me just finish by thanking folks. Uh, Marion Gross, who's not here, is the secretary for this. We, I think we should give her a hand of applause. <laughs> Remember Sanjay Sarma, the Julius Caesar of our triumvirate, who really did all the work for, for this. <laughs> Where is he? <laughs> Sunny Sue, my, my fellow coordinator there. <laughs> Namsu, who, uh, who has uh, uh, ordered us that fantastic clam bake uh, <laughs> last night, but whose idea this was in the first place, and who came to us and suggested that we do it. And we said, ah, do we really want to do this? But, but it, we, in the end, we decided it was a great idea, and I think that it would never happen without you, so thank you, Nam. <laughs> and from my point of view, most important, all of you for coming and giving us input. We're all in this together, even if we're competing for students and influence, et cetera. The, you know, the world is changing because of the information technology revolution. People in this room are making a change, okay? And we, we have to thank you, too. Oh, okay, thanks. <laughs>